Okay, so over the last three videos, we've started to develop um, our rules for anti-differentiating. Um, we do, haven't yet looked at the antiderivatives of circular functions, but we'll revisit those after we've refreshed our, um, well, sorry, we'll introduce those after we've refreshed our understanding of, def of definite integrals. Um, okay, so antiderivatives that we've looked at up until this point are known as indefinite integrals. Um, since we have an unknown constant. So we don't get a definite answer, we get an answer that still has an unknown in it. So it's an indefinite um, answer. Um, a definite integral has limits and can be evaluated to a precise value. Okay. Now the definite integrals do have a connection to area. Okay. There are other reasons why we might calculate a definite integral that isn't about area, however. Um, and uh, what I want to focus on today is separate to thinking about the connection that the integral might have to some sort of area. We want to just look at the algebra of evaluating a definite integral. And again, focus on the notation of it and making sure we're getting the notation right. So if f is a continuous function over the interval um, a to b, um, then we can calculate a definite integral from a to b. Okay, so when I read um, this here, I would read that as the integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x. Okay. The way that we do that, the process of calculation, is to first of all work out what is the antiderivative of f of x. Okay, so that capital F of x, what's the antiderivative? Um, and we don't need to worry about the plus c, but I'm going to demonstrate that in some of the examples. Okay. So what is the antiderivative of f of x? And then we write that in square brackets with the a and the b um, written at the ends. Okay, so notation, let's get that right. Then what we do is we substitute b into the antiderivative, we subtract and we substitute a into the antiderivative. So it's the antiderivative at b minus the antiderivative at a. Okay. All right, let's work through that process. You'll have seen this last year, so hopefully this comes back um, reasonably efficiently. So evaluate the following definite integrals. Okay. okay, so the first thing we do is we write our antiderivative in square brackets. So the antiderivative of x plus 1 is x squared on 2 plus x. And for this example, I'm going to write the plus c here to show you why we don't need to include it. Okay. So for now, I'm going to put it in a different colour here. I'm going to write this in here, but let's just, um, I'm just doing this to illustrate make a point. We wouldn't normally include it. Okay, so we're going to integrate or anti-differentiate between 2 and 4. Okay. So then the first thing we do is we substitute 4, the upper limit, usually a bigger number, but not always, but we substitute the upper limit into the antiderivative. So when we do that, we're going to get 4 squared on 2, plus 4 and plus c minus, then we're going to substitute the lower limit, which in this case is 2, into the antiderivative. So we get 2 squared on 2 plus 2, and then I've still got my plus c there. Okay, so we can simplify and tidy things up, but one of the key things I want us to see in terms of why we don't need to write the plus c is every time, no matter what the antiderivative is, you're going to have a plus c in here, and then you're subtracting the plus c again. So the point is, is that it doesn't matter what c is, it will always subtract in the process of finding a definite integral anyway. Okay, so they're going to cancel out. All right. We've essentially got uh, 4 squared, which is 16 on 2, so it's 8 plus 4 minus 2 squared is 4 on 2 is 2, sorry, 2 plus 2, so we've got 12 minus 4, which is 8. Now, if this problem represented an area, we might talk about square units in terms of that answer, but this is not an area, we are just calculating a definite integral. So we need to understand that distinction. Not every definite integral is representing an area calculation, okay? It does have a, a, a um, it does have a connection to an area, but if this question's not about area, then we wouldn't put square units on our answer. For example, we'll come back to the areas down the track. Okay, so don't need to write the plus c in your antiderivative at all because it will always cancel out. Okay, let's go again. So we've got another one. So we're going to first of all work out our antiderivative, write it in square brackets with our limits on the end. So antiderivative of 5e to the negative 2x is going to be 5 on negative 2, so we're dividing by negative 2e to the negative 2x, and we're doing that between 1 and 3. Subbing in 3, so we're going to have negative 5 on 2e to the negative 6 
minus negative 5 on 2 e to the negative 2. So that's negative 5 on 2, sorry, negative 5 on 2 e to the negative 6 plus 5 on 2 e to the negative 2. Uh, and then we could do all sorts of different things here. You could just leave it like that. You could factor out the 5 on 2 if you want. And you could instead write it as e to the negative 2 plus e to the negative, sorry, minus e to the negative 6. Um, you could take out e to the negative 2 as well if you wanted. 5, e, 5 on 2, e to the negative 2 would leave you with 1 um, uh, minus minus 2, so e to the negative 4, or whatever it might be. Okay, These are all perfectly valid. There's no... Um, reason to write one over the other. There's no plus C because this is a this is a number, okay? It's not, we're not getting an algebraic answer. Um, and the plus C would have cancelled out anyway. Okay, let's do another one. So find the antiderivative from 3 to 4 of uh, 5x minus 4 over x minus 2. Okay, so before we can actually calculate the antiderivative of this, we need to work on manipulating that, okay? So this is going to be equal to the antiderivative. Well, maybe I'll do this separately. So let me just pull that out. Okay, let's just think about 5x minus 4 over x minus 2. Okay, so remember I like to do this by thinking about forcing the denominator into the numerator so that I'm going to be able to do some cancelling down. And then let's worry about what goes around that to make these two things still equal. So there'll clearly have to be a 5 at the front of the bracket to give us the 5x term. So that will give us 5x minus 10 but I need minus 4, so we're going to have to add on a plus 6. So then breaking this up is 5 times x minus 2 on x minus 2. Great. Plus 6 on x minus 2. Okay, so what we have here is the integral from 3 to 4 of 5 plus 6 on x minus 2 with respect to x. Okay, let's calculate the antiderivative. So it'll be 5x plus... Now this will be 6 times log e of x minus 2. Oops, sorry. And we're doing that between 3 and 4. So you'll notice I included the straight lines in my antiderivative um, with the log, um, just to be careful about that absolute value problem. Um, but we, they actually wouldn't be necessary in this particular case, and I'll show you why. So if we're then going to substitute 4. So we're going to get, um, it'll be 20 plus... 6 times log e of 4 minus 2, which is 2. Now, if we write the absolute value of 2 here, all the absolute value, all those vertical lines do, is make whatever's inside them positive. Now, 2 is already positive, so therefore the absolute value of 2 is just 2. So it doesn't, we don't actually, that's why we don't actually need the modulus signs, because we're getting positive values in there anyway. Um, the modulus is about counteracting any negative values we might get inside the log. Okay, so that's substituting 4. And then we're going to substitute 3, so that's going to be 15 plus 6 times log e of 3 minus 2 is 1. Again, the absolute value of positive 1 is still positive 1, so it's just 1. Log e of 1 is 0, so that's 0. Okay. Um, and so we've just got uh, 20 minus 15 is 5 plus 6 times log e of 2. You can put that 6 into the power of 2 if you want, but um, it's not necessary. Okay, so that's our antiderivative, our definite integral. All right, let's do another one. So again, here we've got a product of two functions. So we, before we can anti-differentiate, we need to expand them out. Now, a couple of notes about expanding this out. I could expand out that perfect square, okay? Or I could recognize that what I have here is one minus x times one plus x times one plus x, and instead expand out the difference of two squares. And the reason that's more efficient is because the difference of two squares just has two terms, which when I then multiply it by another bracket of two terms will just require four multiplications. Whereas if I expanded out the perfect square first, I would have had one minus x times one plus two x plus x squared. And we would have had six multiplications to do in expanding that out. So again, thinking a bit about efficiency along the way. Okay, so here we're gonna have one times one is one, plus one times x is x, minus x squared times one is x minus x squared, and minus x squared times x is minus x cubed. Okay, so our antiderivative, 0 to 1 of 1 plus x minus x squared minus x cubed with respect to x. Okay, let's work out the antiderivative now. Antiderivative of 1 is x. Antiderivative of x is x, I'm sorry, x squared on 2. 
minus antiderivative x squared is x cubed on 3 minus x to the 4 on 4. And we're doing that between 0 and 1. Now, when you're finding definite integrals and working with integrals, there will be a lot of fraction work because we generate a lot of fractions in the process of integration. Okay, So if you're not um, a fan of fractions, it's time to get friendly with them. Okay, so let's substitute 1 in. So we can have 1 plus 1 half minus 1 third minus 1 quarter. Then we sub in 0, which will be 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. I want you to be careful. It's very difficult. When we teach integration at year 11, we only deal with polynomial functions. And whenever you substitute a zero into a polynomial function where you don't get a constant value, which um, doesn't, we don't get here, um, it'll always just equal zero. So the risk that a number of students develop in year 11 is that when they see a zero here, they don't do anything. Okay. The problem is, is if this function was e to the x, e to the power of zero is not zero. So there'd be something. If this function was cos x, cos of zero is not zero, so there would be something. So it's really important that you think about what you're actually doing. Yes, in this case, when I substitute zero in, I will get zero, and you probably don't need to write zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. You could just immediately say, okay, it's gonna be minus zero, that's fine. But please don't omit the thinking about substituting zero in. Okay, let's, we really just need to work out the first bracket. We've got four fract, well, two, three fractions and a um, integer there. Um, but we need a common denominator to combine them together. So lowest common denominator is going to be twelfths here. So this is 12 twelfths plus 6 twelfths minus 4 twelfths minus 3 twelfths. Okay, so it's 18 twelfths minus 7 twelfths, so 11 twelfths. Okay, some properties of definite integrals. And these are quite important. We'll come back to these once we also look at how definite integral relates to area. Um, I've provided some proofs here. Um, they're, they're all fairly accessible. Um, so the first property is this one here, in that um, if we are integrating from A to B, that would be the same as integrating from A to C and then integrating from C to B. Okay. Now, we wouldn't necessarily do that, but I guess one of the key things about this property is saying that if you've got this happening, you could combine them together into one single integral. Okay. So we can see that that works because when we do the integral from A to C, we substitute, we find the antiderivative, we sub in C and we subtract the antiderivative at A. And when we do um, this one, we do the antiderivative at B minus the antiderivative at C. And what we find happens is, is that F of C minus F of C, they cancel out, and you just end up with F of B minus F of A, which is just the integral from A to B. Okay. Um, if we're integrating from A to A, uh, that's zero. And that makes sense if you have an understanding about the area under the curve, that also makes a lot of sense. Um, if we're integrating from A to B, f of it, integral of f of x from A to B, that's the same as the negative integral. Sorry, sorry, the wrong around. If we're integrating from B to A in this particular case, that's the same as the negative integral from A to B. So if you switch the limits around, switch the terminals around for some reason, you will get the negative of what you would have got if you didn't switch them. And again, that's just to do with the process of integration and the fact we're just doing the subtraction the other way. So when we integrate from B to A, we find the antiderivative at A minus the antiderivative at B, okay? Which is the same as the negative of the antiderivative at B minus the antiderivative of A. So therefore it's the negative of this integral. Again, switching the limits around and putting a negative out the front is, or, or removing the negative out the front by switching the limits around is a helpful thing. For example, if you've got something where you're trying to work out the negative integral from, um, I don't know, from 2 to 5 of f of x, then in to avoid sort of having this negative floating out here and potentially losing track of it and later on having to have a negative of lots of things, um, you might instead decide to evaluate this as the integral from 5 to 2 which would do the same thing. Okay, so it can be a useful sort of calculation mechanism as well. Um, and then this one, this is one with the next two are ones we're already familiar with. These are properties of general integrals, um, indefinite and definite integrals. So if we have a number times a function, we can take that number outside, okay? Um, and similarly, if we are adding together two front functions in an integral, we can split it into two separate integrals or subtracting. So integral of f of x plus g of x between a and b is the integral of f of x between a and b um, plus or minus the integral of g of x uh, between a and b. So these two we're familiar with already. Um, 
their properties of all sorts of, of definite and indefinite integrals and um, the other three are properties of definite integrals. Okay, so that sort of understanding can be assessed in questions like these which are quite common. So we're looking at, given that the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x with respect to x is 8, evaluate the following. So the first one we want to evaluate, evaluate the integral from 3 to 1. So what we need to be able to think about with all of these problems is how can I rewrite this so that it's all about this, so that I then can substitute 8 into my problem. So I know that if I, the only difference between this and this is that the terminals or the limits around the other way. So I know that the integral from 3 to 1 of f of x is the same as the negative from 1 to 3 of f of x. And I know that the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x is equal to 8. Okay, So I know that this is equal to negative 8. Okay, integral from 1 to 3 of f of x plus 2. So we've got addition here. So we can split this into two separate integrals. So this is the same as the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x with respect to x plus the integral from 1 to 3 of 2 with respect to x. Now note that it's not just plus 2. You can't just take the plus 2 out of the integral. If you're multiplying by 2, you can just take it out of the integral, but not if you're adding because the integral of 2 is 2x and there's actually um, something going on here. So we can now calculate it as two separate integrals. We know that this is 8, great, and we can evaluate the second integral. So it's 8 plus antiderivative of 2 is 2x. We're doing that between 1 and 3. So it's 8 plus subbing 3 into the um, antiderivative gives me 6, minus substituting 1 in gives me 2. So it's 8 plus 4, and so 12. Okay, so some examples of how you can be required to understand those properties of definite integrals. Okay, so we're work today um, just evaluating um, definite integrals, just practicing that process, the algebra, the notation um, is from exercise 11E.